Howdy, everyone. We are back to continue reviewing Dungeons & Doggies Rules Companion. Mm, pardon. You attempt to roast the trap and, and you stutter. We've made some good progress through the PDF and uh, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, where we left off was uh, getting into these class uh, these class specific feats for your doggos. Um, we touched on barbarian, bard, and then cleric doesn't really have a feat per se, as it's just indicating that there is this new domain that you could take. Now, if you are playing a doggy druid, bond of the wild blood, you can call upon the aid of such creatures as would lend it to you. Once per short rest, you can issue a howling cry which nearby creatures will respond to. The DM will determine the exact creature that responds as is suitable for the environment you are in, and this ability may not work if no living creatures are present. A group of creatures will appear within five minutes of being called if able. 1d3 creatures of the beast subtype will appear. The CR of the summoned creatures is equal to your wild shape form maximum CR. Summoned creatures will aid you and fight for you as a friendly non-player character might. They will remain until your next short rest. Mark the ground. You learn a 10-minute ritual to mark the ground and create a circle of territory. This functions as the spell Leoman's Tiny Hut. This encompasses a circle of 20 feet radius. While within the circle, when you use your natural recovery... You may replenish other creatures' expended spell slots instead of your own. Ooh. I mean, look, marking the ground, it just means you're turning in circles for, you know, <laughs> and sniffing for a little bit. Maybe occasionally scratching. The soul of the pack. When you perform a mark the ground ritual, you may create a pack bond for yourself or any number of allied creatures up to your druid level. For one hour, any pack bonded creature may, as an action, roll one of its one of its hit dice and receive that much psychic damage. It may then heal an ally who is pack bonded, and within sixty feet for an equal amount. <laughs> hmm. I get it. Eh. Hmm. I don't know how I feel. I don't necessarily think it's like super broken. I mean, this is taking an action to roll a hit die. Uh, so that being said, you know, is it really, um, you know, is it is it broken? I don't think so. Are people gonna take it or use it? Well, maybe. Kind of gives everyone a cure spell. Um, I mean, a barbarian is definitely gonna be an awesome healer. Uh, it should say that the damage cannot be mitigated in some way, just to be sure. Um, you know, in case, because you can have uh, resistance to psychic or things along those lines. Um, you know, some formatting stuff, nothing too major. It is psychic damage, so indicating what though, TJ? Because it's possible to have resistances or immunities to psychic damage. And so if, if that's the case. So the, I mean, the, the Shatter Kai may may indeed get that, um, 
but there there could be, there could be options in the future, or there could be. I kind of sworn there's something else that um, ends up offering uh, psychic psychic immunity, uh, or at least psychic um, psychic resistance. Uh, it was <clears throat> it was one of the tieflings, I think, out of Morgrave Miscellany. Now that's not an official book, uh, not yet anyway. Uh, so that's something to consider as well. TJ would rule that if you get resistance to the psychic, you would also uh, limit the the amount of healing. And that that could very well be the case. Um, if the point is to get someone up out of dying, then one point is one point. You know, it, it, that, if that's what you're trying to do, then because it's not necessarily a super healing ability. It's an option, I suppose. Although for something like this, if you have this uh, this pack bond and everyone can get each other up, an idea to play with in your own campaigns, especially if you have people who um, who might cheese healing word, is every time someone's brought back from unconsciousness. Uh, they gain a level of exhaustion, like maybe after the first, uh, because they keep getting knocked out. It represents maybe getting concussions or their body is just so fatigued that sure you have hit points, but you're suffering for that because you're constantly being beaten down. And then you're constantly, you know, getting, you know, magic adrenaline pumped right into your heart. The DM I'm playing with at the moment has some rules about yo-yoing characters from being down. That's basically the rules, yeah. Um, because look, on ever since fourth edition, it is. <laughs> I'm sure this is controversial in some way. Um, it is easier to pick someone up who's unconscious than it is to just heal them, right? Because you don't have to dig out of negatives. Uh, you just cast, and they can get up. You know, melee fighter, whatever. Let them go down. Um, I'll just healing ward them back up, and then I'll healing ward them again the next time they go down kind of a thing. Hey, Victor, welcome. We're playing to Annihilation, so death has to have meaning. Yes, that's a great consideration, TJ. I mean, if someone's on that verge of death, if they're bleeding out, uh, then for certain. Um, and it would have to be something to, you know... Well, I, I don't know, maybe not. I, I don't want to dictate what should go on at your tabletop. All right, so these are our druid, uh, our druid offerings. As a fighter doggo, uh, an option is Fangs of the Wolf. You are a master at snapping back at foes that strike you in melee. You may use your reaction to attack with your bite against the attacking creature. Hound of the Foes. When you hit a target in melee with a critical hit, their speed becomes zero for the next turn. You may move to engage a different target within 15 feet as a bonus action without provoking opportunity attacks. The cheese a grave cleric can produce. What's what's uh, what's the grave cheese? Pack fighter, you have become adept at aiding your allies when fighting in close formation with them. Once per short rest, allies who remain within 10 feet of you gain a plus two AC bonus for one minute. That's kind of weirdly worded. Um, so if that's something you have to activate, it should indicate the action that it takes to do so. Um, and if it's just flat out a plus two that can stack with anything, who this is... Um, That could be really big. Especially if you have a paladin friend who has an aura that gives you uh, ridiculous saves to your, or uh, bonuses to your saves. Uh, suddenly you just have this like tight phalanx formation. Uh, and you know, is that bad? Eh, not necessarily. It could certainly, uh, it can certainly get very powerful very quickly. Um, but I don't know, pack fighter, pack fighter uh, I mean, it's worded as what it's trying to encourage, right? Everyone sticks together, moves as a group. 
Um, I don't know if I like it as it's worded, though. Grave clerics, once they once they hit a point, can basically cause their party to never die. Was it just by, like, tossing out a bunch of little, like, nominal heals uh, that kind of keep people functional, but, uh, you know, they, they keep getting juggled? As a doggy monk, guiding paw strike. When you hit with a melee attack using a monk weapon or unarmed strike, you may spend one key point to give one creature within 30 feet of you advantage on its next attack against the target or resistance to the next source of damage caused by the target. The pack is many, the pack is one. As an action, you can distribute healing equal to three times your monk level among any number of creatures within 30 feet. You must finish a long rest before you use this ability again. The Wisdom of Playfulness. You can channel the positive attitude of dogs and their delight at the world. Once per long rest as an action, you can choose to receive the benefit of one of the below effects. Spend one key point per additional creature within 30 feet of you, within 30 feet you wish to affect. Laughing at danger for one hour, you have resistance to a sp uh, specific type of damage, or a specific damage type. Uh, for an hour, you are immune to fear effects. Uh, or for an hour, you have advantage on all int, whiz, and charisma saving throws. I don't know. Again, a little bit of formatting and wording needs to be adjusted to bring it in line with, you know, kind of the, the common presentation. For sure, this supplement wants to uh, wants to strike home that they want all of your doggy characters to be support characters, or at least have the option to be support characters. Heals and the domain ability. I'll have to look into that. Is, is the Grave Cleric in Xanathar's? The Paladin. A friend indeed. You may use your sacred weapon, Channel Divinity, on a friendly creature's weapon within 15 feet of you. As a dog, you may ignore the restriction on holding a weapon. Cool. Cool. That would be something. Not quite sure if it's broken. Um, but I don't know. Being able to... Um, but using that Chandiv in that way. Hmm. It takes some experimentation. Devoted to the pack. When you use your channel divinity feature, you, in addition to your chosen effect... One friendly creature you nominate within 30 feet is encouraged for one minute, becoming immune to fear and resistant to necrotic damage. Loyalty to the last. If a friendly creature within 15 feet of you is reduced to zero hit points, you may use your reaction to use your lay on hands ability. You must then take a long rest to regain this ability. Using Lay on Hands within 15 feet as a as a reaction seems pretty powerful to me. Hmm. I don't know. If any of you have thoughts on this too, if you think something is busted or you're like, oh, I absolutely, I, I'm digging it. Uh, I think, you know, I would definitely uh, play a Paladin that has all of these and, and it is not broken because here's reasons. So is this supplement meant for a dog-only campaign or to add a doggo? Uh, either. All doggos, partial doggos, only one doggo. Ranger, guide the pack. Once per long rest when you reduce a target to zero hit points, you grant up to three creatures within 30 feet of you advantage on their next attack. 
Lead the hunt. When you cast Hunter's Mark on a target, choose a willing creature within 30 feet. That creature gains a 1d4 damage bonus to attacks against the same target for the duration of the effect. Um... So I guess if the target dies and the Hunter's Mark moves, it wouldn't move with it? Apex Predator requires lead the hunt. When you cast Hunter's Mark on a target, choose up the three willing creatures within 30 feet. They each gain 1d4 damage bonus to... They each gain a 1d4 damage bonus to attacks against the same target for the duration of the effect. Okay, so it's the same thing, but you can just target up to three others. Hmm. Well, I mean, if, if you build... I guess there's not really a reason to not take Hunter's Mark, I suppose. Although this does presume that Rangers are going to do so. So, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think many Rangers will, because why not? not and also, not everything can be general. Some things just exist in a specific capacity. The Rogue, Ankle Cutter. When making a sneak attack, if any of the sneak attack dice roll their maximum face value, your target's speed is reduced to zero until they pass a constitution saving throw at the end of one of their turns. The DC for this is 8 plus proficiency plus dex. Ooh, hoo, hoo. So you, ooh, you, you can keep people pinned pretty easily. Since, I mean, Dex is, is your jam. And you may already be getting advantage to hit. And then if you're rolling all of the sneak attack dice, um, you know, getting a six on it. Especially if you have uh, some weapon reroll feats, some other weapon reroll feats, uh, that could be very, very brutal. So a no-save lockdown? I don't know if I understand what that means, TJ. What do you mean by a no-save lockdown? A shadow paw rogue. If uh, blah, 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 blah. You are a difficult foe to pin down. If you hit in combat with a sneak attack, you may choose to move up to 10 feet as a free action. Works with ranged or melee? That's, that's fine. Slashing Claws, Silent Paws. When making a sneak attack, if any of the sneak attack dice roll their maximum face value, you may hide as a free action. Hmm. Like right in front of them, though? Or is that more for ranged only? I guess you'd have to describe that really well. If I'm standing in front of you and I'm, you know, I'm, sh I'm trying to shank you with a dagger, uh, and then in melee combat I can just hide. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, gotcha, TJ. All right. Sorcerer, buried in the veil. Once per long rest, you may bury an object of no more than one cubic foot in size as an action. It passes beyond the material plane. You may retrieve it at any time as an action. You may bury a number of objects in total equal to your charisma modifier. A fun utility. Dimension Digger. You can dig and scramble through the weave of reality. Once per long rest, whenever you expend one or more sorcery points, you may cast the Misty Step spell. Oof. pretty good supportive spell when you cast a spell which successfully affects an enemy creature you may spend a sorcery point to give a friendly creature you choose within 15 feet of you advantage on all their next rolls on their neck oh wait no okay not all within 15 feet of you advantage on their next roll against the target 
Uh, that Should that be labeled specifically, like saves and whatnot? It may sound redundant, but having that specificity is important if you're, if you're trying to generate a rules document. Because the last thing that you want to do is to be in the middle of a session having a fun combat, and boom, the sorcerer character does this, and then suddenly, uh, combat comes to an end, and everyone else is just like, oh, I want it to be over, please, just just make a ruling, I don't care. And, you know, because the DM is like, um, 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 I, I don't know, I, I want to please the player, but also at the same time it seemed busted and we didn't talk about this. Wizard and Warlock. Which, um, um, actually, it should be the other way around if it's alphabetical. <laughs> uh, Wizard, our, um, our, uh, Arcanine, or Arcanine Scrounger. You can temporarily learn others' spells as you scrounge for knowledge. Choose a willing creature and spend 15 minutes with them discussing the intricacies of their spell casting. You may learn a spell that the creature knows as if you have it prepared, but it does not count against the number of spells you can prepare. Uh, you can cast this spell until the end of your next long rest. Uh, dogged casting, you are determined mind when it comes to spell casting. You have advantage on any concentration checks to retain concentration spells that you are required to make. Familiar friends, your natural affinity with the creatures of the world makes summoning familiars far easier for you than most. You may prepare the Find Familiar spell without a spell book. Also, reduce the casting time of Find Familiar to one minute and the cost of materials consumed to one gapa. <clears throat> Warlock, Dark Bark. Your Eldritch Blast is accompanied by an unearthly and disturbing howl from the Hounds of the Netherworld. Once per turn, a creature that takes damage from your Eldritch Blast must make a Wisdom save versus your spell DC, or become frightened of you until the end of the next turn. Ooh. That's, uh... To get that as a free rider on uh, on your cantrip, that's, uh, that's pretty good. A Fey Friend. You call upon the hunting packs of your patron. You may use Find Familiar once per long rest without requiring material components. Regardless of the creature type you summon, its appearance is a smaller version of your own canine appearance, although it appears the abilities of the creature type you call upon. And the Netherhound Companion. Your patron has gifted you a fully formed hunting companion to join the hunt. You may call upon this companion twice per long rest. The summoned companion follows the same rules and behaviors as the channel divinity effect. Invoke duplicity and may and may cast your spells and eldritch invocations. Huh. Yeah, that one seems really good. Uh, the Blood Deuce, it was that day for me as well. I, I'm i with you on that, brother. Uh, awakened Animal as a, as a background. So this is something that all of our, all of our doggies can take if we didn't want them to be raised as an urchin or trained as a soldier, or something along those lines. Let's explore the awakened animal background after I finish this delicious uh, chip and salsa.
All right. Per this background, your skill proficiencies are insight and persuasion. No tool proficiencies, and you get a one language of your choice. Equipment. An object relating to your awakening, such as the worn scroll you slept under as a puppy, or a locket with the image of the family you were born to. A well-chewed toy. And a collar pouch containing 15 gapuz. You can use the vast and often disregarded population of dogs that is found throughout society to your advantage. Uh, this is a friend by every fireside. This is your this is your background feature. Hmm. You're always aware of the local canine population and can seek information about the locality and goings on from the many dogs you encounter. By sniffing popular places and scents, you can instantly learn limited information about a place, such as the quality of water and food supplies, population levels, general mood, and atmosphere. Furthermore, you can usually find a friendly local dog who can help you seek safe and welcoming accommodation, food, and shelter. Dogs, awakened or otherwise, are shaped by their history of development alongside the sapient races as companions and allies. Your personality is likely to reflect this history, and your ideals will tend towards selflessness and maintaining the welfare of those you see as your pack, as well as an instinctive desire to bring and aid comfort. Your bonds are often people of or favorite objects that have great value and meaning. Your flaws may be related to being overproductive to the point of jealousy or a deeply buried resentment at the way dogs have been treated by some unsavory aspects of society, which conflicts with your other desires and emotions. And, uh, and so here's our well-worn uh, chew toy here. personality trait. Huh. When in a new place, I have a need to establish my ownership. <laughs> this everyone rolls in. The, the dog party just rolls into town and they all look for the first telephone pole to mark. <laughs> uh, I love to play more than anything, be it racing around with children or more cerebral fare. I'm not going to go over each of these, but just you know, picking some randos here. Uh, an ideal change. My enhanced understanding of Zavorodo shows me many injustices. I have a deep desire to enact change within the world order one day at a time. Aid. My skills are a gift to the world, and I must assist in endeavors where I can be of use. Decent ideals. Bond. When the one who made me this way set off on their long quest, they were ignorant of what they had given me. I will find them, and together we will achieve greatness. The magical writings of my lost master gave me this gift. Now I bear them to the place they must be laid. Ooh. Very good bond. And what are some flaws? Uh, I regard myself as, as a superior version of my kind. And I am prone to forcing non-sentient dogs into submission. Uh, I fear losing my companions, and so I can re... And so I can react to strangers. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you can re uh, react to strangers with mistrust and even aggression. Okay, nope, that makes sense. Do I need to get the spray bottle? <laughs> hey, they're just doing what's natural. There, there's a post there. Well, it's a big old welcome post. Uh, you know, it, it's also the water cooler. That's where everyone goes to, to just, like, pee about whatever's on their mind. The companion domain. 
Dogs that find their way into the worship of deities usually do so out of a desire to protect and aid others. Consequently, they are drawn to pantheons whose ethos is one of protection, friendship, and family. For such dogs, being stalwart friends and faithful companions is more than a curse. Or, I'm sorry, it's more than a curse. Ooh. Um, it, more than a cause. It is a calling from a higher realm. Some dogs who follow this path imagine canine deities sitting at the sides of the principal gods. An example of such deities is the Good Mother, the principal locus for awakened canine faith and belief. Let's see. Domain spells, Guiding Bolt and Healing Word, uh, Aid and Calm Emotions, Beacon of Hope, Mass Healing Word, Death Ward, Locate Creature, uh, Gaius and greater restoration that seems to make sense to me uh given for the you know the the flare that they're going for here let's make sure we aren't being too redundant with any of this check this real quick <laughs> Tree stride would have been an interesting choice. <laughs> eh, so it's really only kind of close to. It's really only kind of close to the life domain. When you choose this domain at level one, you can use the best friend's ability once for a short rest. Channel Divinity invoke companionships during its second level. You can cause your Channel Divinity to reaffirm your allies' bonds. As an action, you present your holy symbol and evoke a positive energy which can heal and heal and stir your allies. Any number of creatures within 30 feet, or choose any. Each creature affected may gain temporary hit points equal to your cleric level. Not terrible, I suppose. Definitely not good at the lower levels. Uh, and then you get another Chan Div, Lifted Spirits. At 6th level, you can inspire an ally to face down impossible odds and press on in the face of adversity. As an action, you present your holy symbol and nominate one creature within 30 feet. It gains advantage on a saving throw type of your choosing. Oh, and it lasts. Uh, it also lasts for a minute, too. Hmm. Well, a minute is, a, is most combats. Just uh, keep that in mind. Divine Bite. Uh, you get the ability to infuse your bite attacks with the combined strength of your allies. Um, makes sense. I think that's on par with the other um, like melee clerics. Leader of the Pack. At 17th level, you gain the ability to command other Maminals. Uh, while creatures are charmed by your best friend's ability, you can take a bonus action on your turn to command what each of those creatures will do on their next turn. Okay, alright, I, I think I understand that. And th that does fall within the epic level of 17 through 20. Got it. Magic items, I'm not going to go over every magic item that's in here. Um, th there's some interesting, uh, I mean, just looking at uh, the bun bun of soothing. <laughs> Pavel's bell of conditioning, if you get the reference there. Festooned flea collar, Groof's, Groof's gobble charm necklace. 
Yeah, I mean, effectively Scooby Snacks, right? The Snack Sack of Scoobus. Earth Touch Harness. Ah, yes, here we go. The Cone of Shame Cursed Item. Rare requires attunement. Uh, I did not get that reference for the Eye of Wagamoto. What appears to be a fine silver necklace with magical property to grant additional armor. Uh, however, if... So, so we got to work on our wording here, folks. I get what you're going for, but we got to work on our wording. If you want to print this stuff out, if you want to make supplements for 5e, you got to bring it up to, up to snuff. However, if the wearer engages in any of the following activities, assault a defenseless victim, murder, theft, willful destruction of property, outright lying, then a loud booming voice calls out from the aether, bad dog, no, and a magical cone of energy projects around the wearer's head, obscuring their senses. Whilst the cone is projected, the wearer suffers disadvantage on all perception checks due to the enclosure and disadvantage on all charisma checks due to the sense of shame and guilt projected by the magical field. The cone remains in place for 1d4 hours, after which a voice can be heard saying, learn your lesson, be a good dog, and then vanishes. Oh, all right, Evelyn. I gotcha. All right. I uh, see. I I was looking at uh, I was looking at it in a couple different ways. Like you wag a tail, or there's like there's that there's that really good like wagyu beef, uh, that's like super high quality, expensive stuff. And I'm like, well, dogs dogs definitely eat high quality beef. Also, Zebracorn, if I did not say hello to you, then uh, greetings. And I'm glad that you were looking at this uh, at the time that we're reviewing it as well. Oh, that had a... Uh, I, I wasn't reading the descriptions per se. I was just kind of seeing if I could extract any, any puns. Uh... Oh, you know what? Uh, one of the one of the doggos up above, the Dachshund Sorcerer, uh, is wearing this. Uh, see the ethereal plane to manipulate time. Here, let me see if I can find. There we go. Uh, Morgane, the uh, Dachshund Sorcerer. There's a better picture of uh, Morgane a little bit earlier as well. So if you do like the concept of a Doctor Strange style, there you go. There is our sorcerer. I can't believe I missed it, says Evelyn. That is straight up dog tour strange. <laughs> I'll see what you did there, TJ. Hashtag doggo strange. By the way, if you didn't notice it, there's a, a sleeping like a mother hen uh, along with the, the little junior St. Bernard here. And then the little, the little chicky is uh, on top of the blanket. I, this is probably not a reference, but it's, it's something that's kind of cute. Um... Bum, 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 bum. Hermel's Halitoid Hoop. Silgoon's Sleepy Time Blanket. 
Ah, the ever water drinking bowl. Something like this being rare, I agree with it because uh, food and water production magic, it's to me it's not on par with you know like extra dimensions or um, or time travel kind of a thing. Um, but I try and restrict it because otherwise, if they exist, society would demand would demand it. And why why do you have farming villages if you can just magically create food and water all the time? Fenrin, welcome, welcome. I really want to make a doggo druid circle of the shepherd. Well, we might end up randomly generating one uh, tomorrow. The good mother may be worshipped by divine canine adventurers instead of an existing deity. Her symbol is that of a mother encircling a sleeping pup, and she is the embodiment of protection, nurturing, and companionship. All awakened doggies know of the good mother. This is an instinctive understanding and memory of the nurturing they received as puppies. This well-known aspect of the good mother is known as she who nurtures and has been adopted by clerics, bards, and some druids. However, as more doggies awaken, more aspects of the good mother are being discovered. Unlike following a traditional deity, doggies can call on any aspect of the good mother and are not confined to a single aspect for their spiritual lives. The Good Mother means something different and personal to each and every dog that chooses to draw on her strength and nurturing power. Generally, whilst no two dogs might hold the exact same views on what she means to them, there are some overlapping tenets which she embodies for all dogs. Be loyal and good to your pack. Be true to your nature. Rejoice in life. Be unashamed of your joy. Aid and support those... Uh, who you wish to. Your loyalty once earned is unbreakable. It is better to be amongst friends than be alone. Never pass up a chance to play, cuddle, or snooze with another. Oh, and it, it, that was uh, the Grave Cleric was the Xanathar's gotcha. Some doggies have come across shrines to the Good Mother. These cannot be seen, but must be sniffed out. It is said that if a doggy discovers a shrine to the Good Mother, she may enter it by bowing or offering a paw. Once inside this mysterious sanctuary, usually constructed of natural material and with the lingering scent of a recent litter, the doggy feels refreshed and replenished. If some time is spent in the shrine, concentrating on the aspect that the doggy feels closest to, sometimes a boon is conferred. Doggies have reported their coats feeling shinier and softer, their claws sharpening, and their bite strengthening. Some, some parties have even felt the benefit of their doggy companion's boon for a short while when in proximity. If a DM wishes to include shrines to the mother in their games, allow dogs to sense them with a nature or arcana skill check of a DC 12. A two minute ritual opens the shrine, which is a small pocket dimension. I'm, I'm just joking. I, I, I can entertain this. <laughs> just big enough for a, uh, for a single dog to curl up in. Taking a short rest within the shrine confers the dog an inspiration die uh, they may keep until their next long rest, whereupon it is lost if unused. They may choose to gift this to a companion if uh, instead if they wish. Ooh. That's, uh, that's pretty good. Well, pocket dimensions can just be super convenient, and I'm not saying that in a complimentary way. Um, now, for the doggo characters, I'm not going to go over the the minutia of them. These are sample characters that uh, that have their own story, and they draw on different abilities. Um, so, I mean, we'll take a look. I mean, so we have Cassandra, uh, who's a husky paladin. Eh, I don't want to, Evelyn. I don't want everything to be reduced to irrelevancy because nothing you do actually ever matters. Meh. Wine, wine, wine. 
Uh, Cerise, the St. Bernard Cleric. It does matter. No, it doesn't. <laughs> Cornelius. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? Hang on one second. If we're going to go over the doggos, let me show off the minis. Item acquired. Woo. Now I actually have a couple of these at the store because they uh, I, I I got several of them in. Um, and so here, it doesn't make for uh, for good TV because they are uh, they were molded in brown plastic. So. Um, Yeah, I tried. I tried. It is a nice set, and it, it does follow the art that you see. Uh, Ivalon says, but in this case, I'm just teasing Maddie because I find his aversion to other planes astounding, confusing, and a little weird. Yeah, well... I like keeping it close to home, and when suddenly, uh, you know, that's not the case. It's just, I don't know. I, I feel it's distracting and um, convoluted, maybe? I don't know. I have my own aversion to it, uh, but we're all weird in our own ways, I guess. We all have our thing. Uh, Blood Deuce, I feel like people that stare into the face of the multiverse and find themselves robbed of meaning or purpose or weak-willed. I'm not sure how I can clarify that this isn't meant to be an insult, but it's bewildering to me that simply realizing there are other timelines like your own can somehow negate the fact that you've spent your entire life in your own timeline. It is your home, your shelter, and your eventual legacy. It doesn't lose meaning simply because there are others like it. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Hey, uh, Blood Deuce, if you're writing with passion, that's fine. Um, no, just in storytelling, it uh, a lot of this just tends to render things just, eh. Um, you know, it. Uh, so uh, look at it this way: if it's not a matter of convolution, it's a it's a matter of of passion, right? It's a matter of, especially when it gets to time travel. I'm not necessarily I, I'm not as against other planes existing, as I am against uh, any manipulation of time. Uh, or time travel. Uh, TJ is uh, is reforming in the Bacta tank uh, after being scorched by the flame jet and uh, steps out in uh, your brand new self as a female elf druid. TJ, you got what you wanted. Congrats. Time anything is terrible. I agree. Unless it's, unless it's like, ridiculous and campy. Like, I love Back to the Future. Um, you know, and I, I am very okay with Doctor Who. Because even in Doctor Who, uh, time travel doesn't matter. Uh, none of, none of that, nothing matters in Doctor Who. Um, but they realize that. And because they're not trying to be, you know, pretentious about it. Or they're not trying to tell some intricately woven story. No. Doctor Who knows what it is. And it accepts it and pursues it with gusto, and I'm fine with that. Um, you know, Back to the Future is a fun, you know, kind of uh, kind of campy '80s, you know, uh, sci-fi, uh, 
uh, you know, little like time capsule, uh, kind of all, almost in an ironic sense. Um, so I enjoy that, but I also don't take it seriously. Um, I can't really take serious time travel seriously uh, because it just gets so convoluted and I stop caring about the story. And if we're talking about other planes, it doesn't happen as much, but the ability for other planes to simply be an extremely lazy storytelling device, you know, alternate realities, alternate timelines, other planes, um, it has it has been um, a very bitter experience for me. Um, and... Oh, Vayama, thank you. And so I avoid that kind of stuff because I don't want to fall into those traps of um, that, that they can offer. And suddenly, you know, you, you may care about your home, but then you really want to care about these other places more. And you forget, you forget who you were, you forget, you know, what you're fighting for. I know these are generalizations and every character and every story is different. Um, but I just find that the allure is to get into convoluted and or lazy storytelling if you have, um, you know, dimensions, al alternate whatevers. Um, and I just, I, I try to personally avoid it. Um, I'm currently making a Drow Druid for a one-shot that may turn into a campaign. Well, I hope you'll get the, the opportunity to play. Uh, w would you like to describe your Drow character here, TJ? And uh, and uh, maybe Derek will want to, uh, to slap your hand and say, No, bad. <laughs> I'm just joking. By the way, I love that Cornelius has this little bell at the end of the uh, at the end of the wizard hat. Uh, that makes my day. Oh, nice zebra! You were in your first D and D campaign recently, last Saturday. How did that go? Uh, you know, did you feel welcome and comfortable? Did you have a good time exploring your character, telling a story? All you know is they're level seven and a drow. Well, TJ, do you need uh, random character generation so that you can? You can uh, find, you know, the soul of your character. Hey, Joe, welcome. Good to see you again. I'm level five now in my, in my first campaign, and the whole plane travel, I always thought of just a place you could uh, go to through a magic door. I mean, the spell. there are spells that kind of make it like that, where you just walk into a different plane casually. Ah, uh, Flint, the cattle dog ranger. It was awkward. I've been told most first sessions are, though. Had a lot of fun writing my character's backstory. Yeah, it's, um... Your first time will always be a little awkward, Zebra. Um, it takes a couple sessions to get, you know, the decisions of your character, the nuances of your character. If, you are, if you're trying to decide on an accent or some other expression of the character, it, it'll take... Uh, I mean, for anime, they say give it three episodes before you d uh, decide to quit a series. Uh, in d and D, I I would give it... Five sessions? Eh, maybe it, it could technically be less, but... Uh, you really gotta... Everyone has to have a chance to, um, you know, to step up, to be challenged, uh, and to consider their characters. And so I would say that uh, because it's more of a, a loose storytelling than a tightly controlled anime, you're going to need more sessions than the, the baseline of three for that advice. How many doggos are in the book, like, options-wise for characters? There's... The breeds aren't limited, TJ, because the, the races are... You have basic dog race, then you have a sub-race, which is just, like, large breed like regular breed and lap breed. And then you have some other custom elements that might, uh, that might reflect some training or some customized, uh, genetics bred into you. D and D is a bit like making love. Your first time is usually awkward and embarrassing, but you get better with practice. See, 
Yvonne caught my wink. Uh, Joe says, I have a general question. What classes mix well with Monk? I make a new character every week just so I can understand how the game works to improve myself. Uh, multi-class with everything, Joe. Uh, there's... Unless you want to try and, and go for some, like, powerful build of, you know, I want the speediest character ever, and you are, you know, you're a, a monk barbarian, uh, you're, you're a monk barbarian spellcaster with some kind of, uh, like e extra movement, I don't know, like rogue, so you can, you can be a little bit more, uh, mobile on the battlefield. Um, it's difficult to make a bad character, and if you do want to challenge yourself, Joe, make a monk wizard, right? Make a monk wizard. Uh, you'll find a way to have some really cool stuff happen with it. Can the doggos talk to their party or are they regular doggos? They are four-legged doggos. They are not uh, they are not anthropomorphized. Um, so they can communicate to their party. They, they can speak common. Um, they don't have thumbs. Frolicking Llama, howdy, welcome. Yeah, there are online things uh, for min-maxing um, or care-opping, as some people call it. Uh, but you know what, Joe? If you really want to explore D&D &D and what it has to offer, avoid those. Just roll randomly. If you really want to, challenge yourself. I've been looking into the Shadow Monk, and the best thing I found might be a Barbarian or Ranger mix. Joe, I promise you, anything can work with anything. Believe in yourself to make those connections. Anything can work with anything. On a challenge, uh, last year, it might have been actually about a year ago, um, I made a Barbarian Wizard who seems to be the most diametrically opposed, right? If you just look at stats. That was a super awesome and compelling character uh, who went on to be a very central figure in the party that we ended up forming around him in the campaign in which he took place. Freya, the German Shepherd Druid. Oh, she's so sleepy. I wouldn't pet her, though. What a sleepy doggo. Hartley, the French Bulldog Fighter. They try to make the most OP character, which is cool if you're into that, but most characters... Yeah, exactly. Uh, Zebra. Um, I mean, it's not bad to look at what a Karop character, a min-max character can do. You know, it could be fun. It's, it's like, I can enjoy a sports car, even if I don't ever want to race one myself. But, you know, the car I drive is functional and does everything I need it to do, and I love it. And that should be your character. It's functional, you love it. It's, you know, it's comfortable and it does what you need it to do. It doesn't have to have maximum DPR or be able to move 300 feet around or, or things like that. Uh, coerce. Welcome, Coerce. What do you actually need to know to play D&D &D completely blind? The absolute minimum? Uh, coerce. All you need to know is that D&D &D is a storytelling game. It's a game where you and your friends and family can sit around the dinner table or at a table in a game store or at a library and be your own story to play the character that you like. You know, video games are a lot of fun, but you can only do what the video game allows you to do and is programmed to allow you to do. In D&D, &D, it is your story. And so, you know, forget about the dice and the, the feats and, and things like what we're talking about here with the, the best mechanical build for a monk or whatever. You know, maximizing your damage per round. 
like it's a race in a MMORPG. All you need to know, and you do not need any books, you don't need anything, because as a human being, you have been born with this gift, Coerce. All you need to know is that it's about telling a story. If you want to know the mechanics, um, uh, also, of course, I, I try and keep the, the channel PG-13, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, I mean, all you need is a game. If you really just want to invest in one thing that, that's going to get you 90% of D&D, &D, it's this right here. It's the player's handbook. You know, buy it new for 50, buy it used, uh, support your local game store, um, whatever works for you. If you get the, the player's handbook, this is your portal to the mechanics of Unlimited Adventure. Uh, you know, broadly you can course. Um, there are defined skills, but really how you employ those skills is up to you and the conditions that are inside the game. Um, especially with 5th edition, this is a very adaptable, uh, a very malleable form of D&D. If you can come up with a creative reason why you could use whatever skill that you have, Pitch that to your dungeon master, and she or he will will say, you know what, I think that works. That's actually really clever. And roll with it, right? If you if yeah, if the if the dungeon master has a story that allows you to do that coerce, then do it. Uh, if that's the way that the story goes and people are in you know everyone at the table's enjoying it. Yeah, have fun. Do do crazy. You could do time travel and plane hopping, um, extra dimensional stuff. Uh, do libraries have the D and D uh, handbook? Uh, well, I can tell you my local library does because I donated the core rule books to it. Now, I mean that doesn't mean it doesn't get shipped out to other libraries if people are looking for it. Uh, but I made sure that my local library was stocked with the uh, the core books so people could reference them. Um, because I I donate. I'm I'm uh, I'm not a super wealthy philanthropist, but I do donate uh, when I can. Joe says honestly, it started because my friend was uh, watches Critical Role. And grew up playing with his family. He wanted to start his own game, so I started watching a campaign on YouTube. It, so, course, there's a lot of pages in here, but don't let that scare you. Um, because you don't need, you do not need to read every page. You don't have to understand every page. Uh, you don't have to to keep it all together. I've been running, let alone playing D and D. Uh, for almost 20 years now. Well, I've been running for probably like 13, but I've been playing for almost 20. And even in the most recent iteration of the player's handbook, as the dungeon master, I still have to stop and look stuff up. Um, I don't know every spell that exists. I don't know every monster that exists. Uh, and that's fine. So that's, that's why you have it handy. It is a handbook for reference. Um, really, once you understand a couple of the core mechanics, you are set for most anything that you, you want to do, of course. Yeah, so, Ivalon, uh, I, I can back that up. Uh, if you want to learn how to swim, jump in the water. Player's Handbook is a lot, but all you need to know is what you play, which uh, makes it a lot less of a read. And, well, if you... <laughs> <laughs> you say and drown course, but look, if you have uh, friends or family with you, uh, whether they're online or you're playing at your dining room table, um, you're not drowning, right? You have people around you. You're, you're going to learn how to swim. Cage, howdy to you. And yeah, you, you won't be, you won't be uh, alone. 
You're the lifeguard and your swim teachers. That yep, exactly, Evelyn. I'm I'm liking where the metaphor is going. Uh, that would be. Uh, I think that'd be very uh, very difficult to do, coerce. Uh, because in the case that, you know, you are drowning, uh, and you are irreparable, um, you would probably be politely asked to step away from the table and, uh, not bring people down with you. <laughs> but I, I don't want to say that to sound scary, like, you know, there's a requirement that if someone doesn't know every rule that they have to leave. Now, unfortunately, there are... Look, it's life. You get people like that in life. You know, in all matter of stuff, when it comes to a fandom... You know, you get, like, super serious, like, people who are into cars and motorcycles, and if you can't speak the lingo, then, you know, you know, GTFO. Uh, or you you go onto a forum where you just want to ask questions about, you know, Pokemon, and someone just absolutely browbeats you into a pulp, because how dare you not like the Pokemon that they do, or think that it's, you know, you know, or think that there's a better typing of, of it. The group I'm playing with only has the DM played before, and there are five new players, so we struggled it out together. Joe, I'm, uh, thank you very much for saying that, because especially for new players like Coerce, I think that's it's good to not just hear, but to understand. Especially with 5th edition, there are so many new players now. And so you won't be alone. Yep, uh, Ivalon's backing that up. Uh, Wolfie says, I find letting the players make their sheet and giving them ways to look things up and ask gets them to understand themselves. Yeah, uh, Wolfie, that's a good philosophy. For the public game I run at the store on Thursdays, um, I have a new player who's been having some troubles. And so what I've asked him to do every time he sits down, I want you to put all your dice in a row from your D4 to your D20 with the maximum side face up. And then what I want you to do every time you take an action, I want you to narrate what you're doing. I mean, if you want to add pizzazz to it, you may. But I want you to follow along your sheet and say, all right, I'm attacking with my greatsword. So I'm rolling a d20 plus 5. Okay, does a 17 hit? Yes. All right, now I'm going to damage with my longsword, which is a d8 plus my strength mod. That's 2. Uh, so that's going to be 7 points of slashing damage. Ah, good. It's noted. And thank you for telling me. And we have this back and forth, and you, you do it enough, and it, it doesn't even have to take years. It could just take a couple sessions of getting into the pattern. Uh, after you've done it a little bit, you get used to it. Uh, Cage, I specifically chose people who never played tabletops just to expand my knowledge. Oh, and being a new player, you you actually can bring a lot to the table because you don't have the common, uh, maybe the common thoughts or the old the old stereotypes, right? You are adapting and you're you're paying attention to what's going on, and you you're this fresh blood with brand new eyes and ideas on how to utilize uh, spells or items or the like. And so you are actually a very valuable asset uh, to your game as a new player. Llama says, my friends and I have been playing for years and I still find ourselves... Oh yeah, Llama, if I could ever meet a DM that, has, that, can't, or that hasn't looked anything up, um, I would like to shake that person's hand. And is still correct about it, might I add. Oh, you get him to type it out? Okay. As a new yeah, as a new player, you're not jaded yet. Uh, TJ, are you, are you shaking your 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 chains of Marley here? To be fair, even after years of playing, I often still roll a D12 before I realize it's not the 20. Oh yeah, you know, in the heat of the moment, yeah, you, you pick it up and, and give it a go. Fresh with new ideas, Joe says. Honestly, watching other people play on YouTube is what taught me how to play and actually have a story and not just meat grinding. Yes. I mean, having a meat grinder can be a lot of fun. Sometimes on a Saturday night, you just want to build a power character and just, like, and become Goblin Slayer in a dungeon. Nothing wrong with that. That's D&D. &D. But then there's those times where you just you want to be a part of something big, you know, and you want to be in it. Yeah, exactly, TJ. Exactly. Uh, also, if I did not say thank you, 
Um, I, I want to do so uh, for the recent follow uh, from uh, Morning, uh, Morning Mash Bill. If I got that correct, uh, or if you need me to pronounce it differently, let me know. But uh, Morning, thank you very much for that, uh, for that follow. I hope that you've been enjoying your time here with us. Genly, uh, new players, uh, you're agreeing. What I like is they tend to tell what they want to do instead of announcing straight up a particular skill to roll. Yeah, oh no, that makes sense. You know, they, they, they think it's natural. Like, so how, how do I figure out this mystery? Uh, you know, I, I want the, what would be a way that I can figure out how to connect the runes to the pattern in the sky? Instead of just the player telling the DM, I'm going to roll an Arcana as if they know the difficulty class and that that's the and that's uh, and that that's the thing that's needed. And instead, they, they're exploring the idea and not uh, going straight for the mechanics, um, because in that case, nature could could very well be uh, what's necessary. You know, yeah, we're talking about a pattern in the sky, but that could be stars and, and that, that's a part of nature. Um, Arcana might fit into it, but if you're comp if you're using something as the baseline, then why not have your baseline, your control group, be the most vital thing to roll for? Yeah, teaching newbies not to roll and yeah, exactly. Um, it's uh, you know, I I because I've 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 done that, and even a couple of the players on Thursday, uh, where you know it's I'm setting up a social encounter. And, you know, it comes down to, oh, I'm going to roll persuasion, roll. And you just stop and say, who are you persuading? Who are you talking to? What, what are you discussing? And they're just like, uh, uh, uh them, <laughs> you know, <laughs> Oh, Nick Durak. Oh, what? Which food did you make? By the way, to all of you who are uh, who are dropping by here, it's great to see that we have a, a great uh, great amount of people in here tonight. That's awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going over this uh, Kickstarter uh, that it's called Dungeons and Doggies. Now these are the minis that came with it, but you don't need the minis to play. Uh, this was just a, a guilty pleasure. Uh, but we're looking over the rules supplement, and and look, even for even for successful Kickstarters, people who have been most likely playing for years, I have found mistakes in here that uh, you know, and, and spelling and you know consistency, sure. But there's things in here that I think are are overpowered, and could be disruptive. It happens, right? Uh, it's all a process. It's all a cause and effect, a, a push and pull, a give and take. The way I do is I have them keep the roll and they have to live with it, but I tell them that if they don't roll, I probably would have just given... Oh, yeah, th that's another technique you can use, too. Monty, the Spaniel Bard. Oh, what a happy dog. I, I hope in their own ways that these, uh, that these uh, doggos have uh, lifted your spirits. And then we come back around to Morgane, the Dachshund Sorcerer. By the way, fun fun roleplay text if, if you've been reading any of the bits of this stuff. Yeah, so this... Um, I'm not sure I understand what the question is, Course. Ah, uh, yes, Nightingale the Pomeranian Monk. Which, by the way, if you want to see a nice full picture of Nightingale... Um, Nightingale, where are you? Uh, heck. That's right, I said heck. 
I wouldn't say it if I didn't mean it, so you'll have to... I mean, that's just how serious the situation is. Oh, there we go. Heh. Can they even write? It's your story, course. Uh, would you let a four-legged dog write? Would they hold the pen in their mouth and kind of like turn their head and scribble? Uh, would they somehow like learn to keep it between their their uh, paws, uh, you know, their 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 little finger nubs, and scribble? Uh, maybe as a part of their awakening into being a sentient creature, uh, they can use their tails. Yeah, it's coerce. You got it. Look, coerce. You're a D and D player. Hello, we're just thinking of the same thing. It, can you conceptualize it? Then there you go. Make it happen. You know, th this is this is a storytelling game of explaining interesting things that occur in in a, a life, in a setting, in an environment. Yeah, and Zebra, they can just have someone else write for them. Why not? Yeah, maybe they dip their nails into ink, and so they actually kind of scratch. They may not be able to do cursive, but... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, or the DM could give him a magic pen. Um, yeah, it'd be like Norse runes. There, see, coerce. What are you doing coming in here, being like, I've never, I, I'm new to D and D. I'm, I'm uncertain. Look at you. Come on, forget about it, huh? <laughs> coerce, you got this. Gee, th this is just as much of D and D as rolling the dice and doing, you know, and, and adding up your, uh, you know, adding up your modifiers and all this other stuff. This is the, this table talk we're having. This is Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, I don't have a pizza in front of me or some Thai food or whatever, but also breaking bread with people over some D and D. That's a part of D and D too. This what we're doing table talk. This is D and D also. I mean, if you want to roll dice, sure. Here, uh, roll a twenty. Yay! I got an eight. Now I'm gonna roll a D six. Yay! It's a six. Whatever. I'm more interested in finding out how dogs write because we can imagine that they can. The dice are the dice are completely irrelevant to this. A friend of mine once played a gnome sorcerer. They used our low intelligence monk as a mount. <laughs> yes, I like it. Uh, some of the most fun D and D uh, nights. We only rolled the dice. Yeah, you know I'll challenge you. Um, uh, I will challenge you out there. To have a combat in D and D that is purely narrative, don't roll a die, but have it be have it be a meaningful combat, not a training session. Like life is on the line, but don't roll any dice. See what happens. Yes, of course. That is the case. Uh, the dice are... Yeah. Dice are risk and reward. Um, you know, some people want to roll a die for everything. Okay. Um, if that's how the game is, then roll a die for everything. But the dice is, is supposed to be for those moments um, where there is there's, there could be consequences involved that are not petty. I mean, if you want to roll a perception check to avoid stepping in gum on the sidewalk, sure, you can do it. Are you going to roll that, that die every piece, every segment of sidewalk, every step you take? Probably not. Now, as you walk past Crime Alley, for some reason it's named that, right outside of like the, the Gotham State Theater, which is this very nice elite theater, are you going to want to roll a perception check to see if there's a dude lurking in Crime Alley? that might want to rob you and murder your parents? <sighs> Probably. Because at that point, what's stepping in some gum, right? I'd argue that the dice don't drive the story forward, but determine disputed outcomes. That That is a way of looking at it, Ivalon. To be fair, if you want a mostly RP-based game, you're usually better off with a game like Dungeon World or Fate, says Cage. And... And, you know, Cage, there is some validity to that. Not that you can't play D&D &D without dice or without rolling. 
Um, D&D is a role-playing game, and it is certainly a storytelling game. It is also a game, though, that does encourage uh, combat and, you know, sort of putting your life on the line, uh, tactical thinking. Um, is it necessary? No. Is it sort of the default presumption? Yes. And so there is this as a cultural concept that is baked into D&D, which is why expansions like Dungeons and Doggies is very interesting, right? Uh, because it it can challenge... You look at that there, uh, Chihuly, who you get her done, boy, get her done. Um, you know, because this can challenge the conception that you have about D&D, right? If you've been playing for 10 years, suddenly uh, putting yourself in the, in the cloak of a Chihuahua rogue who is a Chihuahua, not anthropomorphized. You are not, uh, you are not a furry. I say that not disrespectfully, is that's, I think that's, the, their claimed title. Um, you are a dog. You are a small dog. So how do you how do you attack, right? How do you approach the world where you're sentient? You know, you exist. You can communicate, but you don't have opposable thumbs. And there's your role play challenge, right? Shake up your conception of the world and have some fun with it. Uh, D and D, but homebrew ended up attracting a stone golem, and he fought for me thanks to dice. Yeah, dice can dice can uh, make these random elements happen and coerce. Um, you know, if you stick around here for our workshops tomorrow, we are going to randomly generate characters, and so the dice are going to decide almost every mechanical aspect of our characters. But our characters are going to be lively. They're going to have a personality. We can rationalize their decision-making because we took the random number generation, the prompting from the character creation, and we said, how can a creature like this exist and fit into a world? You know, what would have to happen? What are some cultural considerations, linguistic considerations? Is this person from a broken home and so feels kind of pessimistic towards the world? If you look at the core of D&D, most things are based on the combat. Well, I, that's how it started, right? It started as Chainmail, uh, which is a, a tactical combat simulator. Uh, Joe says, my DM has his biases of how some classes should be played or built. That's why I started to build my characters every week to prove him wrong to myself. Joe, hey, continual self-improvement is perfectly fine. And that's why, again, you know, if you want to build a, a monk in something more thematic... You know, if you want to go for a speedster, then make a barbarian monk. Um, but if you really want something fun or a good challenge, Joe, roll it randomly, right? Roll it randomly. Uh, monk, and then take a d12 and let that hit the table. And suddenly you have a monk druid. And then you realize, I have a monk druid. Hang on. You roll... And, I mean, even if you get Circle of the Land, which is the more casty one, let's say you go for Circle of the Moon. I have a Kung Fu Panda? Yeah. So, yeah, things like this can uh, can uh, help shape up or, you know, give you different ideas as a Pomeranian monk. Uh, our, beagle our Beagle Barbarian. Svetlana. Oh, she's definitely seen some combat there. You can see the scars right there. Hi, Svetlana. Our Chihuahua rogue, Tedric. Tobias, our Corgi Warlock. Oh, went for a great old one.
Oh, and looky here. I wonder if I can find a form fillable version. Uh, probably for treats, Nick Direct. <laughs> treats or training. By the way, you'll notice that these are dog-eared. Hit dice should be hit bones. <laughs> um, they can. With the rules that we've gone over, you can have a dog that's very good at begging and whimpering and trying to get their way. Uh, and then, of course, we need our, our legalese of the uh, OGL, the Open Gaming License. So there we go. Ah, uh, there we go. There's our druid. Look at her. A character sheet that's fun and readable. <laughs> a dog berserker would go nuts over random stuff. Yeah, uh, court. You know, it, it could be... Um, oh. Uh-oh. Dungeons and Doggies was just the beginning. Sonya, a Maine Coon fighter. And Indy, a ragdoll bard. And, oh, whoa, what's this? Kai, the Shiba Inu Ranger. Dun, dun, dun. Um, yeah, cat's male, uh, chasing a butterfly. I mean, really, if you want. A ranger? What, what do you mean and how? And there we go. How is it ranged? Uh, well, a ranger is is kind of a um, well, a ranger is is like a, a survivalist, right? Uh, someone who can live out in the wilds, uh, can hunt uh, animals or people, can track. Uh, you know, is uh, is very outdoorsy. Uh, I mean, you could think of Strider from uh, Lord of the Rings. <laughs> Chasing after a squirrel, yeah. You could just have a berserker uh, subclass barbarian. Uh, just absolutely go nuts for a squirrel. And yeah, uh, rangers aren't always just ranged users. Um, you can have rangers that are excellent melee fighters. Yeah, so there we go, huh? Not too shabby, huh? <laughs> 